The book of Judges. So remember, after Joshua led the tribes of Israel into the Promised Land, he called them to be faithful to their covenant with God by obeying the commands of the Torah. And if they do this, they will show all the other nations what God is like. So Judges begins with the death of Joshua and basically tells the story of Israel's total failure. The book's name comes from the type of leaders Israel had in this period. Before they had any kings, the tribes were all governed by these judges. Now, don't think of a courtroom. These were regional political military leaders, more like a tribal chieftain. And you need to be warned, the book of Judges is very disturbing and violent. It tells the tragic tale of Israel's moral corruption, of its bad leadership, and basically how they become no different than the Canaanites. But this sad story is also meant to generate hope for the future. And you can see this in how the book's designed. There's a large introduction that sets the stage for Israel's failure as they don't drive out the remaining Canaanites. Then the large main section of the book has stories about the growing corruption of Israel's judges. And the progression here shows how Israel's leaders go from pretty good to okay to bad to worse. The concluding section is really disturbing and shows the corruption of the people of Israel as a whole. So let's dive in and we can explore each part a bit more. The opening section begins with the tribes of Israel in their territories in the Promised Land. And while Joshua defeated some key Canaanite towns, there was still a lot of land to be taken and lots of Canaanites living in those areas. And so chapter 1 gives a long list of Canaanite groups and towns that Israel just failed to drive out from the land. Now remember, the whole point of driving out the Canaanites was to avoid their moral corruption and their way of worshiping the gods through child sacrifice. God had called Israel to be a holy people, and that does not happen. Chapter 2 describes how Israel just moved in alongside the Canaanites and adopted all their cultural and religious practices. And it's right here that the story stops. It gives us an overview of everything that's about to happen in the body of the book. This part of Israel's history, the narrator says, was a series of cycles moving in a downward spiral. So Israel became like the Canaanites, and so they would sin against God. So God would allow them to be conquered and oppressed by the Canaanites, and eventually the Israelites would see the error of their ways and repent. So God would raise up a deliverer, a judge, from among Israel who would defeat the enemy and bring about an era of peace. But eventually Israel would sin again, and it would all start over. This cycle provides the literary design and flow for the next main section of the book. It gets repeated for each of the six main judges whose stories are told here. Now the stories of the first three judges, Othniel, Ehud, and Deborah, they are epic adventures. They're also extremely bloody stories. Either the judge themselves or people who help the judge, they defeat their enemies and deliver the people of Israel. The stories about the next three judges are longer, and they focus in on the character flaws of the judges, which get increasingly worse. So Gideon, he begins pretty well. He's a coward of a man, but he eventually comes to trust that God can save Israel through him. And so he defeats a huge army of Midianites with only 300 men carrying torches and clay pots. But Gideon has a nasty temper, and he murders a bunch of fellow Israelites for not helping him in his battle. And then it all goes downhill from there. He makes an idol from the gold that he won in his battles. And then after he dies, all Israel worships the idol as a god, and the cycle begins again. The next main judge is Jephthah, who's something of a mafia thug living up in the hills. And when things get really bad for Israel, the elders come to him begging for his help. And Jephthah was a very effective leader. He won lots of battles against the Ammonites, but he was so unfamiliar with the God of Israel, he treats him like a Canaanite God. He vows to sacrifice his daughter if he wins the battle. This tragic story, it shows just how far Israel has fallen. They no longer know the character of their own God, which leads to murder and to false worship. The last judge, Samson, is by far the worst. His life began full of promise, but he has no regard for the God of Israel. He was promiscuous, violent, and arrogant. He did win brutally strategic victories over the Philistines, but only at the expense of his own integrity, and his life ends in a violent rush of mass murder. 
Now, a quick note here. You'll notice a repeated theme in the main section of the book, that at key moments, God's Spirit will empower each of these judges to accomplish these great acts of deliverance. Now, the fact that God uses these really screwed up people doesn't mean he endorses all or even any of their decisions. God is committed first and foremost to saving his people, but all he has to work with is these corrupt leaders. And so work with them he does. This whole section is designed to show just how bad things have gotten. You can't even tell the Israelites and the Canaanites apart anymore, and that's just the leaders. The final section shows Israel as a whole hitting bottom. There are two tragic stories here, and they are not for the faint of heart. They're structured by this key line that gets repeated four times at the close of the book. In those days, Israel had no king, and everyone did what was right in their own eyes. The first story is about an Israelite named Micah who builds a private temple to an idol, and that gets plundered by a private army sent from the tribe of Dan. So they come and they steal everything, and then they go and burn down the peaceful city of Laish and murder all of its inhabitants. It's a horrifying story. When Israel forgets its God, might makes right. The final story of the book is even worse. It's a shocking tale of sexual abuse and violence, which all leads to Israel's first civil war. It's very disturbing. And that's the point. These stories are meant to serve as a warning. Israel's descent into self-destruction is the result of turning away from the God who loves them and saved them out of slavery in Egypt. And now Israel needs to be delivered again from themselves. The only glimmer of hope in this story is found in this repeated line in the last part of the book. It actually forms the last sentence of the story. Israel has no king. And so the stage is set for the following books to tell the origins of King David's family, the book of Ruth, and also the origins of kingship itself in Israel, the book of 1 Samuel. But the story of Judges has value as a tragedy. It's a sobering explanation of the human condition, and ultimately it points out the need for God's grace to send a king who will rescue his people. And that's the book of Judges. I, good evening, everyone. I hope you enjoyed that. It's um, quite a nice piece of work, and they've done that for every single book in the Bible. It's called The Bible Project, and you could find it um, on YouTube. And um, I hope everybody got a little rest and you're fresh and ready to go. And next on the agenda, we have um, my dear brother, Joseph Caterson. He's going to do the exposition for us. And we are going to listen carefully, take some notes, and be ready to ask a question. This evening, we want to um, keep not, not, not to make, try to keep it as short as possible, so that many people can get an opportunity to participate. And um, Kelvin, brother Kelvin, will be our um, moderator oh, for that session. Oh, um, David Pearson. Oh, David Pearson. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Angela. Okay, so let's go without further ado. And maybe I should open in prayer as well. Heavenly Father, we thank you for sustaining us, for blessing us this day, for, for feeding us, for just giving us the, the love and the joy of being together, learning from your word, sharing with each other. We, we miss the fact that we are not together physically, but we are, we are together in the spirit. And Lord, we ask that you would bless us and bless what we will experience now. As we listen to the message, help us to listen um, listen carefully and find a hiding place in our hearts for what is said so that it will bear fruit. We give you thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. Welcome back to our session Langham Seminar, Exposition and um, Evaluation. And today, we are going to focus on a piece of narrative scripture from Judges chapter 17. And the title I have given this is How Not to Live by the Word. You see... 
throughout the books of Deuteronomy and Joshua, there are repeated reminders of the importance of living by God's word. There are blessings and curses associated with obedience to living by God's word. And I want to draw your attention to Deuteronomy 29.29, 29, which tells us, The secret things belong to the Lord our God, but the things revealed belong to us and to our children forever that we may follow all the words of this law. That's clear, and that's simple, and that's straightforward. But what happens when we refuse or fail to live by the word of God? That is what Judges 17 shows us. Now a man named Micah, the 1,100 shekels of silver that were taken from you and about which I heard you utter a curse, I have that silver with me. I took it. Then his mother said, the Lord bless you, my son. When he returned the 1,100 shekels of silver to his mother, she said, I solemnly consecrate my silver to the Lord for my son to make a carved image and a cast idol. I will give it back to you. So he returned the silver to his mother and she took 200 shekels of silver and gave them to a silversmith who made them into the image and the idol. And they were put in Micah's house. Now this man, Micah, had a shrine and he made an ephod and some idols and installed one of his sons as his priest. In those days, Israel had no king. Everyone did as he saw fit. A young Levite from Bethlehem in Judah who had been living within the clan of Judah left that town in search of some other place to stay. On his way, he came to Micah's house in the hill country of Ephraim. Micah asked him, Where are you from? I am a Levite from Bethlehem in Judah, he said, and I'm looking for a place to stay. Then Micah said to him, Live with me and be my father and priest, and I'll give you ten shekels of silver a year, your clothes and your food. So the Levite agreed to live with him, and the young man was to him like one of his sons. Then Micah installed the Levite, and the young man became his priest and lived in his house. And Micah said, Now I know that the Lord will be good to me, since this Levite has become my priest. The episode we are reading is during the time of the judges in Israel. After all those lofty experiences in Exodus and Numbers and Deuteronomy, where Israel left Egypt, was delivered out of Egypt, crossed the Red Sea, they received the law at Sinai, they survived 40 years of wandering in the wilderness. Then they crossed the Jordan. They claimed the promised land and overcame most of the tribes there. We come to the period of the judges. And what is said of this period, right in the middle of chapter 17, critical statement. Israel had no king and everyone did as they saw fit. There is a lack of leadership, both social and religious. And knowledge of and submission to God's law is lacking as well. 
there's actually a form of religion and a form of worship. But it's not that which Yahweh had ordained. What can we learn from these passages? The, the main truth that jumps out of us from this, this story is the fact that we worship gods of our own making when we neglect God's revelation of himself. God has revealed himself. He has revealed his plans for us. He has revealed how we should respond to him. But we can neglect that. We could put that aside and do our own thing. And when we do that, we end up worshipping idols. We end up worshipping gods of our own making. In true worship, we seek to know and honor God as he has revealed himself. While in false worship, we go about creating and honoring gods of our own making. The story of Micah, his mother, and his priests vividly illustrate these principles. So let's look at it. Number one, Micah's mother. I, I describe her as a religious materialist. Her son, Micah, steals 1,100 shekels of silver from her. That's a lot. That's like 28 pounds or 13 kilograms. And even at modern day rates, that would be a, a, a hefty sum of money. And she utters a curse. Now, the passage doesn't tell us very clearly if the curse is on the silver or on the person who stole it, which was her son Micah. But it appears that Micah takes this curse seriously because he hustles to bring the silver back to his mother. He returns the silver to her. And she responds by saying, The Lord bless you, my son. That's a good mother to have. But then she goes on to say, I solemnly consecrate my silver to the Lord for my son to make a carved image and a cast idol. With 200 shekels out of it. Doesn't tell us what she does with the rest. Now the first thing we need to consider is in all that we read here, what has gone wrong? What in all of this is contrary to God's law? It's a very short sequence there, just about five or six verses. But there's a lot of things that are going wrong. Number one, they're stealing. There's a curse being uttered. There's a vow being made and not kept. There's an idol being made. A critical part of our treatment and understanding of narratives in the scripture is that we do not take the things that are said in the narrative as the norm or as an indication of what God wants. We compare the narrative to the law. How does it compare to the law? Or as was said in one of the prophets, to the law, to the prophets, what do they say? So we need to understand what should have happened in this situation. Well, Exodus 20 is one of the references that I'm going to pick up in respect of this. And Exodus 20 tells us in verses 3 to 6, You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol in the form of anything in heaven, above, or on the earth beneath, or in the waters below. You shall not bow down to them or worship them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for the sins of the fathers to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing love to, thousands, to a thousand generation of those who love me and keep my commands. You shall, not, you shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not hold anyone guiltless who misuses his name. And then I want to jump down to verse 12, where it says, 
honor your father and your mother so that, they, so that you may live long in the land the Lord your God has given you. And then verse 15, you shall not steal. And then verse 23, Do not make any gods to be alongside me. Do not make for yourself gods of silver or gods of gold. So it's very clear that what they were doing was not in harmony with God's law and what he had told them. So they should not have been making idols. They should not have been stealing. And even if they stole, it should not. The, the, the requirement in the law was that you brought an offering and you gave back in excess of what you, you, you stole when, when, when you were responsible for, for stealing. In the case of Rome, um, cursing, I, I have to go to um, the New Testament here to deal with that. James 3 verses 9 and 10, James says that with the same lips that we praise God, we turn around and curse men who are made in his image. This ought not to be so. All right, so cursing was not in keeping with what God required. And then Numbers 3, 1 to 3 tells us about unkept vows. Once you have made a vow, you were required to keep every aspect of it. But in contrast to this, we see Micah's mother being a little bit like Cain. Cain was also a religious materialist. Cain's basic concept was God must be interested in the things in which I am interested. If I acknowledge him through the things I love and the things I have and the things I do, then he must be satisfied. What else could he want? So, in a modern day parallel, I don't want to go to church and all those kind of things, so I will dedicate my life to football. And every goal I score, I will dedicate it to God. That must please Him. Because He gave me the ability, I'm using it, and I'm saying thanks to Him for it. Now this reminds me of a cartoon with Lucy and Charlie Brown, where Charlie Brown asks Lucy, do you ever wonder if God is pleased with you? And Lucy's answer is very simple. He just has to be. He just has to be. In the midst of their actions here, we need to think back about God's attitude to the Canaanites that they had gone into the, 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 the land to drive out. And what was God's attitude to all the gods that they have. You could remember that he was not very impressed or excited about all the Canaanite gods and, and their, their worship. In fact, he had told Israel to have no part of that. Don't get involved in that. Drive them out of the land so that you do not partake in their sins. So first of all, we see Micah's mother, a religious materialist. Then we see Micah himself. And I want to describe him as a as a religious meddler or a mystic. Mystic or a meddler. Micah establishes a shrine or a temple with one of his sons as the priest until a suitable replacement comes along. He replaces his son with a young Levite from Bethlehem who is looking for a home and a living. Micah expects the blessings of the Lord for all of his dedication and devotion. Again, Let's consider all that has gone wrong and is contrary to God's law in this portion. The establishment of a personal shrine. The establishment of idol worship. He wasn't satisfied with the idol, the cast idol that, that he had made. When they talk about a cast idol, what would happen is that they would carve an image and then they would overlay it with silver. All right? He was not satisfied with that. He had other idols as well. He made other idols as well. Then he had a, a Levite as a priest. Levites and priests had slightly different functions in the um, Old Testament. Levites were responsible for taking care of the physical 
amenities in the tabernacle. But when it came to offering sacrifices or so, you needed to be a priest. And to be a priest, you had to be a descendant of Levi. Of Aaron, sorry. You had to be a descendant of Aaron. Now, we notice that this Levite is wandering. And one of the reasons that he's wandering is that the cities that were established for the Levites to live in and for the people to bring their offerings to the Levites and, and the priests in those cities, quite likely those cities were neglected. And the people of Israel were not meeting their responsibilities to them. So he had to find a way of supporting himself. So he left Bethlehem and went wandering around looking for somewhere where he could make a living. One of the characteristics of the religious mystic or the religious meddler is that he designs, creates, and controls his gods. And he appoints priests of his own choosing. Exodus 29 Verses 42 to 46 has this to say on the same principle we were discussing before where we look to the Old Testament to find out what should have happened. For the generations to come, this burnt offering is to be made regularly at the entrance to the tent of meeting before the Lord. There I will meet with you and speak to you. There also I will meet with the Israelites and the place will be consecrated by my glory. So I will consecrate the tent of meeting and the altar and will consecrate Aaron and his sons to serve me as priests. Then I will dwell among the Israelites and be their God. They will know that I am the Lord their God who brought them out of Egypt so that I might dwell among them. I am the Lord their God. So the lineage of Aaron the location of the tabernacle or the, the, the tent of meeting were critical to worship that honored God. Again, Leviticus 26.1 talks about idol, idol worship and talks against idol worship. Leviticus 26.1 says, do not make idols or set up an image or a sacred stone for yourself. And do not place a carved stone in your land to bow down before it. I am the Lord your God. What Michael was virtually saying is, what I'm setting up here, this is my idea of what God and worship is about. This is the kind of God I am willing to serve. One writer said that God made man on the sixth day and then he rested. And on the seventh day man created gods of his own making. In his own image. What do you think? Should or would God Reward Micah's sincere but misguided efforts. In fact, the scriptures answer that clearly. It is better to obey than to sacrifice. Obedience is priority number one in God's plans. That brings me to Micah's priest, Jonathan. I call him a religious mercenary. He's a Levite from the tongue of Bethlehem, wandering around looking for a home and a living. We learn in chapter 18, towards the close of chapter 18, that he's one of Moses' descendants. Actually, the son of Gershom. One of Moses' sons. So he's Moses' grandson. We also learn in that passage that the house of God, or the tabernacle, was in Shiloh. And that was the designated place for worship. But here we see this Levite happily accepting the offer to serve as Micah's priest. Although he should have known better. He came from Bethlehem and Judah. 
right? He would have passed through the area of Shiloh and he would have been aware of it. But he was willing to take up this offer that was given him. He's not in one of the cities allocated for the Levites because, as I said before, they were probably neglected. So, as far as he was concerned, man must live. Doing whatever he has to do to survive. God helps those who help themselves. But we know that is not so. The road to hell is paved with the most noble rationalizations. What does all of this show us? I would challenge you that the most important aspect of this story is not what happened. It's not what was done. It is what is missing. It is what was not done. And what can we say was not done or was missing from this whole scenario? Well, for one thing, there was no consultation, no consideration of the laws God gave to Moses for the people. Now, if you think back to the Pentateuch, there was the incidents, the actual incidents in Exodus and Numbers of things that happened. Then there were the laws that were given in Exodus and Leviticus. And then there was Deuteronomy. You know what Deuteronomy means? Deuteronomy means second law. It was a repetition of the law and all the things that God has said. And all of it was for one purpose. And remember I told you the purpose at the beginning. The secret things belong to the Lord our God, but the things revealed belong to us and to our children forever, that we may follow all the words of this law. Clear and simple. So there's no indication of a submission to God's ordinance for worship, the temple worship and the annual festivals and so on. There is no consultation with God to seek and to know his will. Does that sound familiar? Doesn't that sound familiar? Isn't that the way we see many people living? If this is how you live your life, it will also turn out to be a comedy of errors and will not receive God's approval. Because... Living by God's word and living by God's law are basic principles and God is precise in that he requires of us exactly what he has told us and what he has said. There are numerous instances in the Old Testament where we see disobedience to God's law resulting in punishment, destruction, problems. We worship gods of our own making when we neglect or ignore God's revelation of himself. And that is the, the, the message of uh, um, Judges 17 because we see this recurrent pattern in Judges where they neglect God's law and they find themselves in trouble and then God sends them a deliverer and then there, there's a rise in hope and there's a rise in, 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 in holiness in the nation, and then that person dies and everything just falls apart again. There is a need for us to take God seriously and to take his word seriously. And if we don't, exactly what we see happening to Micah and his mother and the priest is what we can look forward to in our own lives. So let us do our worship and our response to God as we should. In true worship, we seek to know and honor God as he has revealed himself. And not set up our own standards, not set up our own laws, not set up our own good. But in honor and respect for God who has revealed himself, we respond to that which he has revealed. And in this, we will be blessed. Amen.
Okay, so thank you so much, Joe. Now I call on David um, Pearson. To yes, Lindsay, I'm here. Here he is. Okay, Dave, you take over. Thank you, Lindsay. Uh, good evening, good night, friends. I hope you were listening keenly to our brother Joe as he spoke. And what we want to do now is go through the evaluation of Oh, I'm sorry. I forgot to start my video. All right. As you can see, I'm at the beach. <laughs> yes. Um, so we want to do the evaluation, but we want to follow some a semblance of order as we go. So I'm going to ask you, when we are discussing the various points of the sermon, I'm going to ask you to raise your hands if you want to speak. And I'm going to ask my co-hosts just to look to see whose hands are raised that we can go in an orderly fashion, okay? If you do not know how to raise your hand, you can go down to the, the bottom of your page, I think, and you will see, I think you should see um, something there that tells you that you can, you can um, participate, I think. Can somebody give clearer instructions as how to, how to raise your hands? So, um, no, it's supposed to be participants, but I'm not asking. Okay, Keon, we'd ask you to intercede here because I was going to say check participants, but um, Keon, advise us. How do you raise your hands? All right, well, I'm, I don't have the same thing that you all have, but it's supposed to be right there in the participants list. You should see it under the more, you should see a raised hand option. Participants, you might have to double click. You'll see yourself somewhere, and you'll see a mic. And a Talk to yourself, you'll see where you see more, and you'll see raise hand. Okay. I hope you I hope you heard that. When you click on your name in the participants list, you you should see more. When you go hover over your name, you see more. You click on that, you can see raise hands. So we want to do this orderly. So let's raise your hands that we can go and do it orderly. So the first question I want to ask, do you think that Joe's sermon expressed the main point, the heartbeat of the passage or the Bible that was preached from, the main point of the passage? Anybody? Has anybody raised their hand yet? Okay. Rodel, Watley, could you go ahead, please? Yes, good, good evening. I, I want to thank the man of God for that stirring word. And I believe, yes, after we reflected today on the passage, yes, he, he dealt with the main theme of the passage. We worship God of our own making when we neglect Yahweh's revelation of himself. We worship gods of our own making when we reject Yahweh's revelation of himself. I see some other persons have up their hands, like Rhea, Rhea Daniel Gibson. Yes, I believe um, he got the main point. Also, one of the main points is that we refuse and fail to live by the word of God. Okay. Marva, you have something different to say? Marvel Robley? No, I agree. I agree that he, he okay. showed the heart. Okay. So that was the main point of the passage. Was the main point of the sermon the same or different? Anybody? Was the main point of the sermon same or different from the main point of the passage? Hmm. 
Okay, Marva again, you go ahead. And Rhea also after. Okay, Rhea, you go. It was the same because it dealt with idol worship. Okay, so you think they were a sale. Marv, I'm giving an opportunity again. You, do you think they were same or different? They're the same. They're the same. So he, yeah. he, he, he drew from the, what he saw as the main point of the passage and he took that as being the main point of his sermon. Okay. Is there anybody else who differs, who differ with that, from that idea? You think he did something different? Okay, Lo, go ahead. Um, I see, as they narrated in the message, that it was a nature of the children of Israel to run away from their gods because they were no longer having a particular god or obeying the, 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 the god whom they worship, they should have worshipped, but they just diverted from the true god. Uh, so they did what was pleasing in their sight. So we can see Mika is running, running away to create his own uh, gods to worship. Right. And creating also his own priest. Right. Uh, you call them Mika? That's what you call them? <laughs> <laughs> It's just interesting how, how, how languages are different and pronunciations, but the Bible truth remains the same. Huh? You call Micah? Uh -huh. We say Micah, but I thought I heard you say Mika. Mika, yes. Okay, that's <laughs> fine. It makes no difference whether it's Micah or Mika or whatever, but the text is, is clear as to what you guys have been saying. Okay. Let's move on. Do you think the sermon stayed close to the text that was being preached from and explain what the original author meant? I want you to say yes or no and give me reasons for your answer. Did Uncle Joe stay close to the text in the sermon and explain what the original author meant? Give me reasons for your answer. Don't all speak at the same time. Thank you. Rodel? Uh, I think that uh, co-hosts don't have uh, a raised hand. Is that so? So can we just unmute if we want? Okay. Yes. Um, can I go ahead? Sure, go ahead. Yes, you see, you asked, did you stay close? I first said yes. Uh, and why? I say yes. Because when he made his first, his, his um, heartbeat was very much the center of the, the, the passage. And then in every point he made, he, 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 used, he used the text to emphasize such a curse, stealing, so everything he did. And the contrast he made between what was in the passage and what should have been from the, um, the law. And he made a very important point when he said, we do not take what is documented in the narratives as a normative, but we compare it to the law. And so he went through every step of the way uh, with a fine comb tool, pulling out everything. <laughs> fine tooth comb, right, 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 right. That's, that's true, you know? And he mentioned the point that he made in the seminar today that we always go back to the law to get the, 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 the very basic teaching. Angela, you wanted to say something? Yeah, I would say that he stayed very close to the text, but he went just a little beyond to chapter 18 to get his right. conclusions, for example, to, to be able to say that uh, 
if you live like this, you'll end up in disaster. So it's really impacted you seen with the CD disaster. But understood that it's um, you know, we, we just have a short time and so we mm -hmm. could only deal with chapter 17 mm -hmm. tonight. Yeah, and, and that's one of the challenges when we preach from the narratives. Sometimes the narratives, one one episode of a narrative story might go over several chapters, and when you're preaching, there's so much in it that you might you may need to preach it as a series over a number of sermons. Okay, and so I think Joe. Because of the limited time, he took he took the opportunity just to mention it. That's not to say that he couldn't preach about it again, you know. But I agree that because the time was limited, he wanted to push in that point. Great. Anybody else want to comment on that before we move on? Joe wanted to say something, David. Go ahead, Joe. Yes. Um, what I wanted to say was that um, I, I felt you know, there's a situation in, in court where there are certain things that the um, prosecution cannot go into because of um, disclosure and so on. But if the um, defendant open up that area of questioning, then it is free for the um, prosecution to exploit and go down. Right. That and I felt a key verse in that whole thing was the very last verse um, where I think Micah was opening up a, a question. God is going to bless me. God, God has to bless me for what is going on here. So the question is, will God bless him for this? <laughs> and, and that was like an open, I felt, to, to go and look at what had happened in other times in scripture when people had done things opposing, you know, different to what God had, had revealed and, and, and um, different, um, even in that same going on to chapter 18. And Truly, as, mm -hmm. I, as I told you all, I really would have preferred if we could have done 17 and 18 together, but mm -hmm. it, time didn't really permit. But I felt that there was enough meat in 17 to, for us to um, dig into it and learn a lot. And I think we did. Yeah. So, so, so it, it, it would be fair to say that you could have had a second sermon next week, whenever, when yes. we worship God. When we worship, when we worship, okay, we worship God's, uh, our own making. We worship gods of our own making when we neglect the worship of God, worship of Yahweh, right? We perhaps could say something like we we reap the cancer benefits and rewards, the wages. The wages, good word. Wages of our own worship when we when we worship gods of our own making or something like that, you yes. know, because that follows naturally then into chapter. Then into the next chapter, chapter as you said, you open the door. Yes, it's a, it's a nice it's a nice follow through, because right. there are things that come out as to the implications of all that was happening in chapter seventeen. A lot yeah. of the real implications of it didn't come out until chapter eighteen. That's true. But as you say, that, that could be a, a separate uh, a follow up uh, message. And then that verse that says in in that day there was no king in the land and the people did what was right in their own eyes, you know. I think this is the first time it is mentioned in Judges, but it's going to be yeah. mentioned three other times, and each time it gets worse. Yes. You know, each time you see the repercussions being worse, you know, so it's an interesting way to move forward. If other Bible texts were referred to, did they throw a helpful light in the main text of the sermon, or did they distract from it and confuse people? I want people to give some answers. Do you think he used other Bible, Bible verses well, or were they distracted? Charles or Sabrina or both. <laughs> Unmute yourself, please. Hi, I'm Sabrina. First of all, I found this whole way of approaching this particular Judges 17 very, very interesting. Uh -huh. As usual, uh -huh. our people at St. Augustine never fail, okay? <laughs> um, so kudos to, to, to Joe and to Kelvin and to Lindsay and even Angela, hello. But the point is this, he used as he opened up with his title, how not to live by the word, which is interesting twist on the whole thing. And then he moved on to tell us about Deuteronomy and Joshua. 
and you know that's living by the laws of god and then he actually went into deuteronomy 29 29 to tell us about the secret things of the lord and the ones reveal love for us and then he went on with the text and so on and then later on when he he used this interesting way of um pulling out the facts of the of the thing like what was wrong with with this whole scenario stealing cursing vows made that weren't kept idols being made and then he used references he used exodus 20 you know different points of the um 10 commandments and then exodus 23 about not making gods of gold and silver and you know what is amazing to me with this whole thing when i read it i was so disgusted i did not know why you all chose judges 17 i said to my husband I said, this thing does not glorify God. I don't understand why we have to be studying something that is not lifting up God, but I'll do it. And I did it. But the point is the way you handled it, it, it really brought out the way we tend to live in our world today. It's, it's like, you know, choosing things that we find are pleasing to us and twisting it so that hopefully it will please God, because this is how I feel I should live. And yeah, um, yeah. you also went on to make your quirky little examples. You know, luckily we didn't have a therefore to explain why it was therefore. <laughs> that, that's, that's my, if it's one thing I remember with you is therefore. <laughs> but he did use the examples of um, not going to church and going to play football and hoping every score would be um, glorifying God. And then the Lucy and the Charlie Brown piece, you know, a little comedy. And so, so it, it might be Okay. I'm not hearing her at all. Last part. She still sounds up broken off. And said they were supposed to be Could someone send our message, please? I'm not hearing her. There was what is amazing to me more. Uh, is anybody else hearing her? No, she, she seems to be breaking up. I'll call her. Okay, I'll, please I'll call, call her and tell her for me. Let's hear from, from Rhea again. Rhea, your hand is up. Um, what I like how he went back and gave us the history. So he started and before he read into Judges. And then when well, he come and he gave us the examples with Exodus, you shall have no other God before me. He came and talked about honoring your father and your mother, the stealing he spoke about Deuteronomy. He went to James talking about the lips that we bless. We bless right. God with the lips and then we curse people with the same lips. Um, he spoke with Leviticus, bringing it, talking about the idol worship. It's about idol worship and against idol worship. You know, so um, numbers about the unkept vows. Right, right. So all in all, you know, the scriptures were brought together and it shows us, he was showing us that we worship God, that they, sorry, not we, that they will worship God for their own making. So, you know, he was explaining with the true worship and the false worship. Thank you very much for that. I, I like your very thorough um, recollection of what Joe did. I had a question for Joe, though, on one of those passages. Um the, the same one about you must keep your vows. Joe, does that mean that we keep all our vows, even if they're stupid? Okay, that's, that's a good point. Um, Ecclesiastes has a, a lovely portion on that, where it says, God is in heaven, we are, we are on earth. So, so don't, don't rush to make any hasty vows and, and, and so on. Um, just, just be careful about what you're doing. But Sam also says that one of the characteristics of the man who um, could stand on God's holy hill is that he keeps his vows even when it hurts. Now, you, you cannot keep a vow if it is 
sinful, if it is if it's the wrong thing to do, if you committed yourself to do something wrong, there's no requirement that you do it. In fact, right. there's no requirement that you don't do it. Right. If you vow, even if it hurts, you should keep your vow. Okay. So that is my understanding of, of what the Old Testament says on the issue of vows. Yeah. So one, don't be hasty. Right. But if right. you have committed yourself, um, you, you have to stand by it. In my mind, that was the only verse that you mentioned that distracted me because of that question I had in my mind. Okay? That is the only verse that kind of took me away. I said, wow, does that mean that like Jephthah? Jephthah made a stupid vow. Should he have kept it? But that's a different story. Okay? Somebody yeah, had... I, uh, you know, the, the comments are briefly on that. I think he kept it, you know. I don't think he killed her. I don't think he, he, um, he, he put her to death. But I think he kind of separated from her because uh, uh, it, it, from the way the story that you see the build up of Jephthah, I feel Jephthah would have kept the vow. He was that kind of person. Yeah. So he would have done something, maybe not fully what, you know, yeah. we thought, you know, he's saying that he would put her to death, but I think he would have done something um, in keeping with what he had said. All I would say is that in the book of Judges, the, the, we, we are not required to believe that he didn't kill his daughter. Because that is totally in character with the whole book. Yeah. And that's it's really true. stupid. It's true. Charles? Hi, I just wanted to ask Joe one thing though. When we had read on in chapter 18, and they said um, around um, 1828 that the Danites rebuilt the city and settled there, and they named it Dan. And then they went on to talk about the. Jonathan, son of Gusham, son of Moses, became their priest and his sons. I thought to myself, I wasn't sure if he was the original Levite that came from Micah's house. So I wanted to ask you where you found out that this Jonathan, son of Gusham, was the same young Levite. It, it, it's in the flow of the story in that he was actually... In fact, that is the importance of chapter 18. Chapter 18 shows um, another aspect of the story which we didn't pick up. I didn't pick up certainly, but actually one of our groups picked it up. The fact that when you go off, you set up a train of events that can get worse and worse and worse. You know, so that um, from just Micah having this shrine, next thing you know, there is this um, priest and this setup up in Dan. And I don't know if you, you are aware of it, but later on in the history of Israel, that shrine up in Dan became a center of worship okay. and, and a, 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 a source of, of tremendous division and separation. So much so that when um, uh, under um, Rehoboam, the, 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 the kingdom split the the yeah. northern tribe said you go ahead and stay we're uh, worship in jerusalem we're going up to dan <laughs> we will worship up in Dan. so a little how to say a little to hold you know was widened to become a, a big split between the northern and the southern kingdoms and then throughout the rest of the book of um chronicles and kings you hear about uh, Jeroboam, who caused Israel to sin and establish the the calf in Dan, right? So um, it was it was it was not a minor thing. It was a very very big issue that was building up there. Thank, thank you, Joe. We we have Kevin and Rodell. The last two comments on this question: Kevin Doyle and Rodell Watley. Afternoon. Good night. Um, mm -hmm. I'm looking here again as I was listening to Pastor Map today. When you read over things, you have to read it three and four times. Now, he used an analogy of football, one, and he said he was going to dedicate the goals to, to Christ, God. to God. Right. But, and I immediately, the verse that came to mind is 1 Corinthians. Where well, I have it, First Corinthians 10, 31. Do it all for the glory of God. Yeah. 
But so the question, did Micah do all of this to the glory of God? <laughs> because in the end, in of my in he asks, now I know that the Lord will prosper me. Right. But but to be fair to, to Uncle Joe, if I might butt in here, to be fair to him, it's not that he was saying that scoring a goal can't be dedicated to God. But scoring a goal, being dedicated to God as the way I am going to worship God and not do what God says is a problem. Okay? It's not that it's not that I shouldn't give all my David, life to God. I'm just yes. giving you I'm giving you a little time reminder here. We have five more minutes left in this session. Okay. Okay. All right. So Rodel, quickly, please. Rodel, go ahead. Okay, rather is there. Let's go to relevance. Let's go to the question of relevance. Did the preacher build bridges from the world of the biblical text to the world of today? Anybody? I, I think very much so. We see we see religions today like uni, Unitarian Universalism. And anything goes, they make up their own religion. And right. so it's so very relevant to how people want to be religious today. And they, they, whatever their idea of God, and that's what he brought out very effectively. Okay, thank you. Anybody else on that? Were any illustrations that were used appropriate to your own context and helpfully explain it? The relevance of the text. Joel? Yes, I, yes, I, I would like to say his uh his use of um of the example of football, you know, and that's that's that that's simple enough. You know, we make we make idols out of the things that we choose to do or we we choose to occupy our lives with and tell ourselves that God must be pleased. And I thought that was extremely uh relevant. And um, and it, and it and it draws us back to how easy it is to make idols in our lives, and um, and when we refuse to conform to what God's requirement for our lives is, we say, well, God must simply be pleased with whatsoever I, because I'm making an offering because I, I acknowledge God in what I do, and right. God must be satisfied. I thought that was brilliant. Yes, yes. Thank you for that, Joel. Ria, go ahead quickly, please. Oh, one of the things um, when he was talking about it, what it was not what was done, but what was missing. So sometimes there are a lot of things that are missing. You know, we always stick on what is being done. But he spoke about in the end what was missing. Yeah, and you thought that was very relevant to us. Yes, because in today's world. We normally look at what is done, what somebody doing or whatever, but you're not even looking at what you what missing from you or what you not doing, say so missing from your life, but you're looking at others to see, well, idolatry, you know, like fornication, those things are blatant. You could see right. them, right, but right, right. you may not be um we doing on prayer and them kind of thing that you may not be praying as you're supposed to and all like that. So it's missing from your perspective. Okay, thank you very much for that. We have just a very short time left. Okay, in what other ways would you have applied this text if you had been preaching it? Anybody else think you could apply it in another way? Rodel? Go ahead, Rodel. Is there anybody else? How yes, else? yes, good night. Yes, good night. Good night. No. This is the habit, well, the habit he used in terms of, I just want to read it again. We worship God of our own making when we neglect Yahweh, revelation of himself. Now, I would have moved to preach the gospel with that passage because oh, Christ is the it. final revelation of God. And, you know, to recognize that when worship is misplaced from things to the building to tradition, rather, and Christ himself, our worship will be out of place and call okay. back to, you know, to the heart of worship. 
And in that way, you would have brought, you would have brought in Christ more clearly. Thank you for that, Rodel. Anybody else? In what way would you have done it differently, if at all? Great, Uncle Joe. Most people think that they, that you have done it the way that they would have done it. Was the message Interestingly, interestingly I had a way that I would have done it differently. In the, you know, <laughs> <laughs> it's, I'll give it, kind of I'll funny, give it but, 20 seconds, 20 seconds. Yeah, the group that I was leading looked at it from the point of view of legacy. Legacy and influence. Yes. Michael's mother and her influence on him and where he went, and then his influence on the um, the Jonathan and the legacy that Jonathan would have had. Imagine the grandson of Moses behaving like if he doesn't know the law, you know. And and right. the, the things that go wrong when we start bad legacies and the way okay. that they lead to bad influences for long times to come. Okay, let me ask a last question and then we are going to close this, this part. What methods did the speaker use to make the structure of his sermon clear? Anybody? What methods did the speaker use to make the structure of the sermon clear? Hmm. I think he, he had a, a, a very clear outline. So, he, so his, his structure was based on the three um, characters, the mother, Michael, right. the priest, and he began in the same way in each, in each case, um, Michael's mother being a religious materialist, uh, Michael being a religious medalist and the priest being a religious mercenary. So you know he's going on to a different point and you're getting his structure there. Right. And he was using alliteration there of sort. Right. So that was great. Okay, Lord, you add up your hand. Last comment. Okay, hello. Brother Grace. Okay, that seems to have changed his mind. So thank you, friends. I'm going to turn over back to the moderator for the evening. Thank you so much for your participation. Thank you. Um... David, you're very punctual. I was going to let you take another two minutes, though. But OK, um, you think we got through? Yeah? Yeah, we got okay. most of it. All right. OK, so now we are supposed to have just a short section. You all remember it's a Tobago seminar. So we want to do some praying for the Tobago Preachers Clubs and some planning. And we want to ask Kelvin Mapp, who is the facilitator, for the Tobago um, Regional Club, if he could lead us in that session. All right, Calvin? Yes, and good afternoon. afterwards you will uh, come back. Good afternoon, everyone. We just want to again welcome you, and particularly those who are coming from Tobago. Uh, first of all, we'd like to let you know that Tobago does have a regional club uh, that meets about three times uh, during the course of the year to uh, further what we are doing here. One, sometimes we, we do a revision of what is here. We study a passage together and we have an exposition on it as well. So, and together we have done some very interesting things. We, last year we, under uh, Brother Pearson, we did a study of the character of uh, um, Peter. We did an overview of the book of Songs of Solomon. Um, before that, we looked at a outline of the book of Jude uh, together and then you also did the Ramesh Richards book, uh, first three chapters of Pastor Lauren Green led us through in terms of where we reiterate at a very personal level, a very group level, very entertaining level, the whole question of going through again the Langham method or methodologies to be used in preaching. Again, we tend to meet on a uh, 
let me just check the screen. We tend to meet on a, a Saturday morning, um, uh, somewhere between uh, 12 and 10, uh, 10 and 12 on a Saturday evening, then we, we sort of meet together. Uh, we have used different places. We are based in Lowland Life Church, which is the church of um, Pastor Lauren Green, but we have gone to other places. We have gone to Castara, uh, we have gone to Pembroke, uh, and therefore we have been all over Tobago so that we, we, we want to encourage people uh, in terms of those who are in Tobago to come together to join us. Uh, um, and those of us who have participated have found it very, very meaningful. In terms of our next planning, we tend to have the next session out of, after the seminar, our next session tends to be in November, uh, probably the second or third or fourth weeks of November, there we want to be just outside the Christmas period. And therefore we want to probably continue that trend again into our session in November. And our last session, of course, given the COVID requirements was one like this online, one like this online. In terms of topic areas, again, those who are joining us are quite free to suggest a topic in advance. You can send it to me or Pastor Lorne and, and we will uh, sort of collate it and then decide together which sort of uh, topics we want to do um, and, and advance the work forward in Langham, Tobago. Of course, we are longing for more members. We start off quite good. We had a quite a good number. But of course, over time, we sort of settled on a lower number per se. But we, we like everybody who's from Tobago in this seminar to truly join us going forward. Anybody who's into a uh, regional club in Tobago, are you here? Could you just give a, a word of um, encouragement or testimony, please? Anybody from the group in Tobago? A quick word and testimony. A number of them, Garrett Caesar. Yes. Uh, Quincy Batiste. Any of you from Tobago? Brother Caesar, you want to say a word quickly on, on testimony? Before he comes on, Kelvin, I'm not from the group in Tobago, but I have heard tremendous reports about the food. At this oh, yes, yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, the food is exceptional. <laughs> uh, uh, okay. Brother Caesar, are you there? I'm not seeing Brother Caesar. Yeah, well, he opened up his mic, but I'm not hearing him. Hearing him. Can anybody see me? He's talking now. Yeah, you can speak. Oh, go ahead, Brother Caesar. Yes, good evening, everyone. I would definitely encourage you to be a part of the Preachers Club. I think it is an extension of, of everything that we have learned from Langham. And it's, it's an interesting way to develop your skill because a lot of the times, we do things with the support of, of the people in our church and who lift us up and help us give the message that we want to give. But when you actively sit around with other preachers in that close-knit environment and hear the challenges and hear the successes, it really opens up your mind and opens up your skill level and talent to where you want it to be. So I would encourage everybody to definitely join the Preachers Club and I missed out on some soup the last time, so I definitely need to, <laughs> <laughs> to make sure I come back for the next one so I will get my get my soup and everything else that is on offer. Okay. So not to take up too much time. So we will most likely meet in November. Uh, Pastor Lauren Green will be reaching out to those of Tobago in this seminar uh, just to confirm uh, the time and the place and any suggestions for a topic. Of course, you can reach out to him as well. And hopefully by the end of... Um, October, early in November, you get a place, a place and time and topic. So we just want you to stand by for that in terms of, of, of our next meeting in November. I can Kelvin, I ask you, Kelvin, well, can I say something quickly? Yes, because there was one of it, yes. Yeah, and, and distance, distance is sometimes a very important thing. Since I've left Tobago, it struck me that one of the things that the Preachers Club could do a little bit more is to exchange pulpits on a Sunday morning, if that's possible. Okay. I found that, you know, that would add to the fellowship. 
Okay, that's a, that's a very good suggestion. Um, very interesting suggestion. You see how that works and how, how we see that works in Tobago in particular. Um, so so you, want, you want to remember that. Okay, could I ask Joe, could you just pray for the group in Tobago that God will continue to encourage us and help us to go forward. We use Trinidad to support Tobago here. Thank I'm you. To do that. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for the work of the uh, Preachers Club in Tobago, the, the meetings that they've had, the topics that they discussed, and, and the, the encouragement that they have given to those who are serving you in Tobago and seeking to, to hone their skills, to improve their ability to interpret and apply and uh, proclaim your word. We pray for success as they go forward. We pray for a, a good um, gathering in November. We pray for the topic and the venue and all the details um, that you would guide and that you would bless. We pray that you would continue to show yourself strong uh, on our behalf, Lord, that, that there will be that rising up uh, of, of a, a new commitment, a, a new um, a availability of your people to, to be used by you to proclaim your word. Because as, as John Sott said, you, you want to, to, to build up um, the church and you want to spread your word. And preaching is one of the critical aspects of doing that. Help us to be better preachers. Help us to be better students of your word. Help us to be better um, disciples and, and people who obey your word. And Lord, help us to preach out of a, a conviction and a reality of the, your word touching and transforming our own lives. And we commit all of this to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So again, look out for us. Make it, make, look, out for, look out for us making contact with you in Tobago. So Angela, could I hand back over to you, please? Yes, thank you, Kelvin. And now we're going to go into the um, closing session. And I want to hand over to a little lady, Mrs. Rutan Ramata. Lon, unfortunately, still was not able to make it today, although he did try. Um, and you haven't heard much from, you haven't heard anything from Rutan for the whole, whole seminar. But along with me, there she is now, Rutan has been one of the main movers for establishing Langham preaching in Trinidad and Tobago. So she's going to take us through this final session. Rutan? Okay. Unmute your mic at the bottom of your screen, or Kian can do it. Good night, everybody. And shouting is because I want to make sure people in Pakistan, delegates from India, St. Kitts, Uganda, they can hear me. Um, you know, that's funny because we can all be in the same room at the same time, and it's because of Zoom. So on behalf of Langham preaching Trinidad and Tobago, it is my pleasure to walk you through these final moments of the closing ceremony where we do two things basically. We appreciate our laborers and we congratulate you, the participants, for studying diligently and by rewarding you with a certificate and you would have gotten your book already or probably still to collect. Um, before I go further, I want to ask um, two people to volunteer, one from level one, one from level two, to share briefly in about 30 to 40, 45 seconds, a wow moment they might have had or a light bulb moment they may have had during the seminar. You know, a moment where the dots were connected in your head. And you said it now makes sense. I am seeing something different. I just love this point. So I, I want you to um, raise your hand to Keon and Keon will select the two of you later on in the program who will just share for about 30 to 45 seconds, a wow moment you had in level one or in level two. So I want to recognize a couple of people and I want to show appreciation to people who are in the background, and I call them the backbone team. They are coordinators, Pastor Lauren Green, who you will know very well, and also Angela Gibbons, who has been working diligently with 
know, and in terms of pulling the seminar together. We want to also recognize Tracy Yeward, who is doing monitoring on YouTube right now, and she would have been the one to receive your payments and make sure that all your accounting business is in place. And I want to say special thanks to our technologist, Keon Reed. I, I call him the invisible man who makes visible things happen. And um, if you felt that he delivered Zoom, he's the man behind the Zoom, just give a thumbs up. Keon and Keon, we appreciate your hard work, your diligent work in actually making this go seamless. And just as we are borderless, seamless, and everything has flowed, you know, tremendously, like if we were face to face in the classroom. So many thanks. And at this time, I want to probably pause. I don't know, Keon, if, did anybody volunteer from level one or level two to share a wow moment? I'm seeing we had 39 participants. Um, I don't want Casey um, sharing no markers because they are sharing a little later. So anybody else beside Casey and the markers? to share one of those wow moments. I, I am seeing Marceline and Marceline's because I'm seeing your picture <laughs> on my screen. I don't know if you would like to share a wow moment. Uh, maybe nobody had any wow moments. <laughs> yeah. Um, I had a couple of wow moments. One of them for me was we read in the scripture, especially when we did Psalms and we were shown how to look at the parallel parallelism and reading it, it, it's as if it, the scripture just came to life. Um, and also reading it over and over and seeing so much, um, see, being able to see it so different, both for Psalms and for today um, with the passage from Judges 17. Um, as you go through the verses and we pull it apart, there's just so much to it. So it's kind of like, for me, bring the scripture alive and like you just want to like eat it like food now. Um, yes, that was a real wow moment for me. Great. And I see my son is from Tobago. So could we have somebody either from Trinidad or from outside of Trinidad? probably St. Kitts or Uganda. Oh, hello, I think I saw you when I came on sharing. Okay. What excites me? Are you hearing me? Yes, yes I'm hearing you. Yeah. Okay. Uh, what excites me is the presentations which have been very clear. Um, and then the way the scriptures is il illustrated brings it out very well for one to understand. Um, the groups getting into the rooms for chatting has been exciting. Uh, it brings participation. It brings opportunity for one to express himself and share his thoughts. Um, then the topic I liked, I liked both Psalms 93 and I also liked uh, Judges 17. It really portrays how God is sovereignty is and also how we can go astray uh, from worshiping the true God, which which uh, Joseph has uh, illustrated that uh, it has bigger repercussions yeah. when you go astray. That was okay. been my exciting moments, mm -hmm. and to get to know you people, it also it's, it broadens the family of God. Uh, I've loved that. Thank you so much. 
uh, for sharing all the way from Uganda. I'm sure it's, is it morning or midnight in Uganda this time? Uh, just a moment. Uh, I have loved to have this opportunity because I have never been to a Bible school. But this, <laughs> this is an opportunity that uh, I've had or to sit at the feet of people who can expound the scriptures right from Genesis to Revelation. Uh, I have been in ministry for 40 years, uh, but it's all been the revelation of God the, uh, in upon my life to inspire me. Uh, but I would have loved to be a student of God's word. We will pray for that to happen at some point. So, and you have taken me to my next point in recognizing our team of facilitators and workshop leaders. And by now, you know them by name and nature Joseph Caterson, Kevin Mapp, Lindsay Gibbings, David Pearson, Angela Shirley Gibbings, Francis Warner. These are our team facilitators and workshop leaders and I, I just want to add to what Okello has said you know, they actually pour into your ministry like a cup that run over these two days and um, that has come from them personally walking with God for about 40 years and more studying of the word to the point where they have shown themselves approved and sharing regularly and consistently and committedly with others from the pulpit, from the pulpit and person to person. And on this point, I want to ask Marcus Randat to just say thank you to our facilitators of level one and say some words of appreciation. So Marcus Randat would now say some words of appreciation. Okay, hello and good night. Um, I'll be reading from a piece of paper. I had to write my stuff out so I'll make sure I say clearly. <laughs> what I wanted to say. Um, just one other thing before I start, you know, um, you know, if it wasn't for COVID, we wouldn't be able to see and interact with um, my brother who just shared there. It's so, it's so amazing and that's really true technology. We can actually hear people uh, and be a part of what's going on, you know, together all over the world. So I really, uh, I give God thanks for the opportunity to be a part of this. So hello and good night, everyone. My name is Marcus Ramdat and I attend Grace Chapel. Chinese Christian Fellowship at 49 on Circular Road. I was asked to give a closing thank note on behalf of the Level 1 class to our Level 1 facilitators of this year's Langham Telego 2020 Preaching Seminar. This is my first attendance to the Langham Preaching Seminar, but not my first time being part and experiencing the ministry's purpose. I recall my last experience hearing our late brother, Dr. Ravi Zacharias, speak on an online session. I was really moved by the passion and desire he spoke about in being able to be a part of God's global move to preach God's word to the unsaved peoples of the world. Indeed, this seminar has really challenged me. May I also say on behalf of the other level one attendees as well, that it was indeed a privilege to all of us. This experience has indeed given us more of an appreciation of God's word. Also to clearly see that it's not just about reading and saying what you want and think you fully understand everything. But feeling the heartbeat of the passage, seeing the skeleton, and then adding to the meat of the bones so that they come alive. Those are just some of the things I, I, I learned as I went along uh, in the sessions. Wonderful illustrations used, as I'm a person who also likes to use these things to get across some of my points. Then being able to put, begin putting together a message as we did in our last breakout room session today. It was thought provoking and also very encouraging to me as doing a Bible study. I thank God for his provision and timing and allowing not only myself, but all the participants the opportunity to be part of this year's seminar. So with this said, Pastor Kelvin Mapp, Brother Lindsay Gibbings, Sister Angela Shirley Gibbings, on behalf of the Level 1 class, we say a heartfelt thanks to you for your sacrifice, time, commitment, 
and willingness to be used by God through, his, through this ministry of teaching and equipping of his people for his honor and glory. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I would now call on Kizzy Hooper to say thank you to Level 2 facilitators. Good night, everyone. You all hear me? Hear you? Okay. So on behalf of the Level 2 group, I would like to thank our facilitators, Mr. Joseph Peterson, Mr. David Pearson, and Ms. Angela Shelley Gibbons. We had Mr. Peterson and Mr. Pearson for the majority of the session, and then we had Angela coming in as our timekeeper, as our reminder, as our, as our principal, and then she shared with us today about preaching from the Old Testament. What I have especially appreciated is that both Mr. Pearson and um, Mr. Caterson, they present the word of God in a way where it's accessible and you feel as if they are genuinely interested in the word of God. So it's almost like by osmosis, you want to be excited about it because they are so excited about it. Also, Mr. Pearson's voice the way he speaks his tone, it makes you feel as okay. He has something important to say, so you should be listening. So I want to really appreciate them for taking us through. Um, what I wish for them, even as they will continue, and also for Angela as well, is that Proverbs 11.25 will be real for them, even as they have refreshed us, that they too will be refreshed. So thank you very much for doing what you did this weekend, well, these two days, and continuing to do what God has called you to do. Okay, thank you, Kizzy, so much. And now we are going to get to the heart of the session for tonight, the calling of names for the certificates. Usually, if we were in the room all together, we would have been handing out certificates, etc., cetera, to, to level one, two, and the graduates. The graduating class, we have 10 persons graduating. Um, we are going to call your name last. We are going to go through the names for level one first, then level two. And Kion is going to just show your face on the screen to recognize. So Kion, I'm ready. I'm going to start calling level one participants. And from Tobago, we have Anne Natasha. Okay, everyone, please turn on your cameras. And then again, they may not be actually here. So if nobody responds, go ahead. Okay, sure. So we have Anne Natasha from Tobago, Erica Bailey from Trinidad, Amy San Juan from Trinidad. I, I know E.B., but I'm not seeing her. So, okay, there she is. That is E.B., yes. Um, we have Robert Ramjohn from Trinidad. Thank you all. We have Jeremy McIntyre from Trinidad. Wendell okay. Roberts from Tobago. Wendell Roberts, Kevin Doyle from Tobago. Hi. Hi. Donald Grant from Tobago. Wendy Spring from Trinidad. Hi. Okay, night night, Marvel Robley from Tobago. Marvel, hi Marvel. Uh, Sheridan Peters from Tobago. Also, if you all would just say hi, that will bring you all up because yes. if, if you're in speak of you. Right, Sheridan Peters, um, Rosan Galera, 
from Tobago, from Trinidad. Lana Taylor from Trinidad. Good night, everyone. Good night. Hi, hi. Marcus Ramdat, Trinidad. I Selma Matthews, Trinidad. Hi, good night, everyone. Hi, hi. Uh, Steph Stephanie Antoine, Trinidad. Yes, good night, good night. Marceline Melville, Tobago. We heard from Marceline just a while ago, yes. Paul Gibson from Tobago. Hey, Paul. Ria Daniel Gibson from Tobago. And Benjamin George from Tobago. Hi, Ria. So please unmute your mic when your name is called. Unmute it from now. Sorry. All right. Good night, yeah. everyone. Hi, hi. Good night. Benjamin George from Tobago. Lennox Andrews from Tobago. Braxton Francis from Trinidad. Nicole John from Trinidad. Braxton, hi. Nicole John from Trinidad. Hi, Nicole. Anella Barkas from Tobago. Hi, Anella, okay. Hi, Anella, right. Nicole Squires. Oh, Nicole is going to graduate, so I'm going to call her a little later. And, well, Gar Garrett Cecil from Tobago. Garrett, hi. Paul Joseph from Tobago. And we have Garvin Cardogan from Trinidad. And Irma Cardogan from Trinidad. And Patrick Floyd from Trinidad. Okay. Hi, Patrick. So we will now identify or recognize the graduates and we have Robin Gill all the way from Pakistan. Is Robin with us? Okay, probably the time soon. Prakash Naniwadaka from India. Prakash, are you with us? Okay. Oh, hi Prakash. So you're graduating from Trinidad with your certificate. And then we have Rodell Watley Hello. from St. Kitts. Rodell Watley from St. Kitts graduating. We also have Okello Grace Michael graduating from Uganda. We have Nicole Squires Modest from Trinidad graduating. We have Joel Spring from Trinidad graduating. We have Charles and Sabrina Motley, both of them are graduating. Hi. All right, hi Charles and Sabrina, both graduating. And we have Kizzy Hope graduating from Trinidad. And Quincy Batiste from Tobago. All right, congratulations Kizzy and congratulations to all the participants for achieving the certificate of participation or graduation, meaning that you have gone through three levels of the Lancome process. Uh, at this stage, I just want to give a few announcements. Um, the first announcement is about the use of the material that we have provided or you have gotten, um, the slides, handouts. Um, feel free to use it, but kindly do note where you got the material from you got it from Langham Breaching, <clears throat> Trinidad and to be use it widely, freely, but bear admission to the source of where you got that information from. Also, the January seminar opens soon. At the end of November, we will be sending out advertisements for registration at the end of November. And then Preacher Slubs will continue we will be sending out notices about preachers clubs. 
um, we also want to recognize, the, you know, rem remind you to complete the evaluation forms online. We need those evaluation forms to help us, you know, tailor our program to inform our program to be better in terms of our delivery. We want to remind Trinidadians to collect their books and certificate at the Scripture Union office um, from Tuesday morning. Um, we open at about nine o'clock, say from 9.30 onward until five, you can collect your books and your certificates. Um, we would appreciate you call before you come. So we would be alerted, the office is small, it wouldn't be overcrowded with you know, participants, participants collecting their books and certificates. And then you would have gotten a link to join the Keswick Friends and Family session for tomorrow night at seven o'clock. You can get another good expository message at seven o'clock tomorrow night if you click on that link. And the same time in November and December, I don't know if you may be familiar with Jonathan Lamb who came to Trinidad from the UK a couple of years ago to do a long -term seminar. Um, he will be preaching at Keswick next month, November. And then if you're probably old enough, you would probably know David Corbin, resident in the USC. He'll be coming in to, or zooming in to do the Christmas message for Keswick in December. All right, so those are my brief announcements. And now I would, the, the moment I call this moment, the Kumbaya moment, where if we were together, we'd hold hands and gather around in a circle and saying we are one in the spirit, but because of the limitations, but, and along of the, the limitations, we, we there are also, um, you know, advantages. So we know the advantages outweighing the limitations. At this time, we want to ask Charles to sing the song. And if you, and we're going to put the words on the screen, what you can do is sing along with Charles in your home as he sings that song, and then he would close the meeting in prayer. <clears throat> and that will be the end of Tobago Seminar 2020. And I will hand back over to Angela to probably give the final closure after he closes in prayer. So Charles, go ahead and sing. We are one in the spirit, close in prayer, and hand over to Angela. Thank you. Just to add, as we sing along, we sing in with the microphones muted, or we will have loud feedback, loud, um, noise right well you know so let charles will sing and we'll sing along with our microphones muted yeah mm -hmm. we are one in the spirit we are one in the lord we are one in the spirit, we are one in the Lord, and we pray that our unity may one day be restored, and they'll know we are Christians by our love, by our love, yes, they'll know we are Christians by our love. Oh, praise to the Father from whom all things come. And all praise to Christ Jesus, his only Son. And all praise to the Spirit who makes us one. And they'll know we are Christians by our love, by our love. Yes, they'll know we are Christians by our love. Yes, they'll know we are Christians by our love. Father, we just want to thank you so much for this course. Thanks for sending, Lord, the people to help us to understand it. Thanks so much. And thanks because, Lord, you know we are slow. You actually send your Holy Spirit to open our minds and to help us along because we need all the help. So we want to thank you so much. Thanks to people like Joe and Kelvin and Francis, Lord, and, and David. Thank you for them. And, 
Angie and Lindsay and all the people behind Lamb that make it possible. We are so grateful. Lord, just bless them and bless all the participants. And Lord, bless the people who will be hearing the preaching and benefiting from it. Lord, just thank you for your spirit just pouring on all of us. We are so grateful. We bless you. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. And I just want to say a special thank you to each and every participant, facilitator, everyone who came out. You know, we were really wondering how this online seminar will work. And you were such a good and enthusiastic group. I think it could work. I think we could do it again, right? Yes, <laughs> so, yes. thanks everyone. Yeah, thanks. It's good morning here, 4 a.m. Oh, <laughs> 4 a.m. <laughs> I've had an overnight here. Bye-bye, <laughs> um, guys. I have to leave. Bye. Bye. It's thank been you. a good sacrifice. Thank you. Thank you, Lindsay. Thank you, Dr. Chili. Thank, uh, thank you all very much. Okay, bye everyone and thanks. Bye. Thank you. Bye everybody. Bye. God bless you. Bye. Thank you bye. And Angela. Okay. Bye. Bye, bye Selma. Thank you. Bye. 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 Goodbye. Bye. Bye. Good morning. Nice. Yeah, good morning here. <laughs> good night there. <laughs> we shall keep in touch on email, Angela. And WhatsApp. <laughs>